inquire all those questions you've always wanted to know. Ask Katie anything. Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of Ask Katie Anything. I'm your host, licensed marriage and family therapist, Katie Morton. Today we are going through, I think, yeah, eight questions. And it's interesting how even when we don't have a theme to how I ask the questions, like I'm not asking for a specific topic, they still tend to hover around, you know, a couple of topics. I think we have made two main ones this week. Um, And if any any of you notice, my skin color is a little different from my face to my neck. And that's because I dropped my powder on the floor and it broke all over the place. And then I ordered one and they sent me the wrong color. And so I ran to CVS this morning to get a powder and it's just not quite right. So anyways, I'm just saying that because I always get, you know, comments on stuff like that. Um, So I'm working on it. (laughs) Anyways, without further ado, let's jump into this first question. And this question reads, hey, Katie, do you have any advice for someone who doesn't have friends or a relationship, but both wants and doesn't want any of it? I have social anxiety, so making friends tends to be hard to begin with, but I often feel bored and lonely and want something to do with other people. However, when I think about actually having friends or something, I tend to hate the idea because then I have to actually talk and be around them. And yes, I realize how weird this sounds. Any advice? This was interesting because it sounds a lot like kind of like what I'd call like avoidant personality disorder. It's not necessarily that, like I'm not diagnosing you with anything, but it kind of has a flavor of that, right? Where we don't, we kind of enjoy our alone time, but then sometimes we feel like we should have someone around. I guess, I guess that my question would would be more around what do you want? And what do you not want about it? Because instead of trying to focus on like, how do we make friends or how do we be more social? Because we don't really know if that's what you're needing. I'd be curious if there are like certain patterns to when we want someone around and when we don't want someone around. And I guess the reason I'm going in that direction is because I'm curious if if the not wanting people around is like linked to a mental illness like depression or anxiety or is it because I have a lot of patients, for instance, who have social anxiety, who desperately want to have relationships and also desperately don't because the thought of trying to start one is overwhelming, right? And can send us into a panic attack. And so it's kind of that push pull. So I'd want to know where this is coming from for you. Um, Also, a lot of my uh, patients with borderline personality disorder or BPD feel this way too, because if we let someone in, then they could hurt us, but we don't really like being alone, right? And so there can be these complicated feelings around relationships and know that you're not alone. Relationships are difficult and can bring out a lot of good and bad things in our lives. And I don't say that to say that like having relationships is going to bring out the bad things. I'm just saying that in the same way relationships can highlight positive things like you're really giving and consistent. It can also um, highlight bad relational patterns that we have in our lives like this push-pull, difficulty in communication, maybe wanting people around, not wanting people around, um, not communicating well, all sorts of things, um, our difficulty with arguments and disagreements, it could bring up any kind of thing, any kind of like relational patterns like that. And so that's more my question. And the reason that I'm going in this direction is because once we have that answer, then we can figure out what our next steps are. Because let's say it is tied to social anxiety. Well, then we might need some exposure therapy or some anxiety treatment in the form of either medication or other, you know, relaxation techniques, whether that's like, you know, going for walks, breathing exercises, full body shakes, coping skills like a fidget toys and, uh, grounding techniques, you know, it just kind of depends on what's coming up for us. And then that can help us best manage it. And so I, that's really where I would go. So if any of you are feeling like, oh, I do want people in my life, but then I don't want people, push, pull, push, pull. Where, where's that coming from? When is it that you want someone? And when is it that you don't? And along the lines of both, like, are there certain scenarios that exacerbate it? Like, for instance, if we go back to the social anxiety example, if the idea of having to go out to meet people in groups is what stops you and what makes you not want it, because you're like, if I have to do that, that's overwhelming. I'll be sent into a panic attack. That's helpful. Or if on the flip side, it's like we want someone because we you know, feel really isolated and we really want someone to like fill this void in our life. Like we feel like I, you know, 
that attachment urge that like I feel not whole without someone else. Um, we want to know that. And that's all really incredibly helpful and can help us kind of not necessarily just heal, but best manage these symptoms and figure out what's best for us. Because depending on what we're struggling with, it might behoove us to either have relationships or maybe work on ourselves for a little bit longer before trying to engage because, you know, we need to get the symptom management there first. Um, Does that make sense? I hope that makes sense. And so that's really my advice is to figure out where this want and not want is coming from. And both are just as like, it's equally important. Okay. Now there was a comment on this is another question. Hopefully it's related. I have like three friends other than my husband, but in general, my friends do not have a lot of time to spend with friends. We're all moms and really busy, but it bothers me. I feel like maybe this is why I've gotten pretty attached to seeing my therapist, but I'm trying to put more space between appointments so that I won't be so attached, but it is super hard. I haven't seen her for more than a month now, and I'm trying to wait until July, but I'm struggling. I know I need to figure out how to have friends be a more important part of my life, but I find it frustrating that no one has the time. I know my therapist is always there and always listens and is always helpful, but I also know that I shouldn't rely on her or get attached to her, but I already am. How do I make good changes so that I don't rely on her so much? I know I can't do it forever, but I do love her a lot. And I've been seeing her for a year now. Now, this is a great question. And the truth is that it sounds like we have this hole or this void. I'd be curious about um, upbringing. Like, were our parents emotionally neglectful? Like, it sounded like they might be good, but they're not. Or was there abuse that happened that was more overt, like physical or sexual abuse? Um, I'm kind of just curious where this, this urge to to fill the void with a therapist or with friends is coming from just out of curiosity does not mean that there has to be an answer. You might be like, well, there was nothing like there's nothing there. And that's okay too. We have to be curious, not judgmental about things we can learn about ourselves, which will in turn give us the answer as to why this is happening. So let's be curious. This void that we're feeling, is it that we need more friend time? That might be it. There's no, again, there's no judgments, right? It's just being curious. So if we're feeling that, hey, I just need more friend time, then my encouragement to you would be to reach out to your friends and schedule in the future. Because I, trust me, I'm 38. Almost all of my friends are mothers. And I find that the easiest way to make time and to um, get to see my friends who are moms is to constantly schedule get togethers. Now, it depends on if your kids are around the same age, you can get together and let them play together and like double whammy to kids get tired, you get to hang out, win-win. But if they're totally different ages, let's say one's like a baby and one's like four, then you might want to schedule, you know, um, either time at the park or going on a walk or I don't know, it depends, right? Or you might want to get a babysitter and have like your time at night or, you know, navigate that with your partners. But I really think that scheduling is going to be key because it sounds like what you're missing here is connection. And even though, you know, we love our husbands, our partners, they can't be everything for us, right? We can't expect to get everything from one person. I know that kind of goes against the like old adage of like finding your soulmate and being together forever and everything's perfect. No, you're finding a partner for life that yes, there are parts, obviously you work really well together and it can feel like some of the things that you're missing, they have and vice versa. However, there's a huge importance in having other relationships to fill the void and to have someone else to talk to and to do things with. I know that goes against kind of like the romantic view of like, oh, you find your soulmate and you're everything for one another. And I'm not saying that we can't find a partner that is, you know, a great life partner. A lot of the things we lack, they have and vice versa. But there's a huge importance and a huge value that we need to also place on other relationships, other people who can aid us in our life and help make us better people and us to them, right? We need different dynamics of different relationships that can fill different roles because we're not like one dimensional people, right? We have a lot, there's a lot to us and we can't expect one person to be all the things we need. And so anyways, so I think what's happening potentially is either we have some, you know, abuse attachment stuff from our childhood, which that would mean that we need to do some more, more like a more in-depth inner child work with our therapist. And I would encourage you to see her more regularly, but to talk about this attachment and these urges, um, that could be, that'll be really important 
otherwise you know the therapy could become not as therapeutic if they don't understand that this is coming up for you but we need to do some of that inner child work and then we need to figure out how to navigate new relationships in a way that's healthy for us meaning that we can acknowledge when we want to be with someone and we need to check in on ourselves and find if it's something that we can give to ourselves or if this is just the connection with another person that we're craving yes i know right now that can feel completely impossible to tell the difference but as long as we're taking time to heal that inner child and to give to ourselves i think it's fair to say that when we feel the urge to see someone else we should see someone um, like a friend is what I'm talking about. Um, let me see if there's anything else in here. How do I make good changes so I don't rely on her so much? I think, again, it's in that internal work to figure out where this is coming from. And if it is that connection with friends that we're needing, then we need to schedule things out. Yes, people get, we're all busy. Let's just be real. I feel like at a certain point, I don't know when it happened, maybe in like 30, 32, We become incredibly busy as people in a different ages for different people, right? But we all have lives and and can keep very busy and I can hide in my work too and not make time for my friends. And so it's really important that I schedule that. And so let's schedule out a few of them. Call your three friends and schedule out hangouts. And if they're like, well, I can't do this week. Okay, let's look at the next week. Like let's plan some get togethers. I think having those constantly or at least consistently in your schedule each month, maybe more, is going to be helpful, okay? And again, letting your therapist know that this is coming up for you and this is why you keep pushing your sessions out because I don't think, even though I appreciate the fact that you're like, I don't want to rely on her too much, so I'm going to not see her as often. It's more important that we tell her about that urge to rely on her than it is just to try to kind of ignore it and push it away and almost try to make it more difficult for us to do because the true the truth of it is that it's actually really helpful information for your therapist to know that this is coming up for you and it could help guide the next stages of your treatment does that make sense i hope so now there was another question that said along the same vein how do you deal with loneliness and become super emotionally independent like the person above so that was that first question right um I live with friends, but they are honestly very mean to me. So I wouldn't call them friends, just throwing that out there. Um, But I have to live with them because I went out of state for college and I still have a year left. So moving would mean that I would lose a lot of credits and would have to move home. Um, I guess I have a question about that because I went out of state for college too and I could still move. You have a year left, so you could sign a year lease somewhere or you could request a change like in the dorms you can always change um it might take them a minute to do it but they'll make it happen okay my mother's become super abruptly agoraphobic and i don't um know what else oh and i don't know what else but whatever it is she's super abruptly not emotionally available the whole situation has left me incredibly lonely and i feel so out of control since i'm very used to being dependent on others for helping me maintain my emotions Ooh, enmeshment now i'm alone all the time I need to learn to be okay alone. My friends know that I need need them. So I think that's why they are okay being so mean to me because they know that even if I distance myself, I'll always come back. So toxic. What should I do? I'm 20 and I feel like I'm trying to become my own friend and my own mom, et cetera. The hardest part of all is that the independence and loneliness and responsibility for being there for yourself all comes with having no friends and little support. How do we deal all on our own? There's a lot in this. Now, first of all, again, those aren't your friends. Those are bullies. Uh, True friends aren't mean to you. So I'd encourage you to stop calling them that because they're not. And I wouldn't rely on your roommates. That's exactly, that's all they are as roommates. I would consider moving into another apartment if you can afford it on your own or someone else or asking to change dorms if you can. Because I, like I said, I went out of state for college too. And those are all options. Um, I always stayed in the dorms, honestly, because it was like cheaper and easier and it was closer on campus. So that was what I preferred. Um, Okay, so that's that's one thing. Second thing is, is clearly we have some enmeshment here and there's I have a couple. uh, I don't know. I mean, there's like a free group codependence anonymous. I don't know if you've heard of codependence anonymous, but you can look it up. That's a free group, just like AA, like Alcoholics Anonymous, Narcotics Anonymous, Overeaters Anonymous. There's a ton of these, you know anonymous type groups um even though what i think is happening here is more enmeshment meaning that there there are no 
boundaries in your relationships, what their mood is, is your mood because there's been no emotional attunement in your life, meaning that your your mom or dad or whoever your primary caregivers are never showed you when you were a child what it's like to feel an emotion and regulate it ourselves and communicate it. And it doesn't have to happen all at once, obviously, but our parents are great models for behavior, especially emotional behavior. And having a parent also be emotionally attuned to us, meaning they recognize the emotion that we're experiencing because we're expressing it in one way or another. They acknowledge it. They express con- uh, concern. Let's say the emotion is is hurt. We're crying. We're very upset. They say, I see, oh, I'm so sorry. I see that you're hurt, right? They're attuned to what we're experiencing. They validate and then they support. We didn't get that as a child. And so in essence, we're always trying, we're always dysregulated and we're always looking out for what's okay to feel. And if our parent was volatile, let's say we had an abusive parent, then we can feel like we're walking on eggshells to not disrupt them so that we it doesn't happen again. It's kind of that like fawning response that we've talked about in relation to trauma. It could also mean that we look to others to help us regulate because we never were taught how to do it on our own. Again, none of that modeling behavior. I hope this is kind of making some sense. So that's all tied up into this like add-on question. And so my advice to you would be if you can get out, get out of that living situation because those are not friends. And I'd encourage you if possible to either communicate to them that how they treat you isn't okay. And then I give you full permission to not talk to them anymore. Um, because they sound like bullies and assholes. Um, and you have a whole year left in school, so I, you can definitely sign a lease or change dorm rooms or something like that. And you don't have to move home. Those aren't your only options. Let's be honest. I know because I've done it myself. Um, so there's that. Then the fact that your mom is not available, that's because she's dealing with her own shit. That's okay. I cannot encourage you enough to get into therapy. I hope your school, like my school, has counseling services available let's get you in touch with those and ask right away like how long they'll see people and what the rule you know what the rules are for mine it was like endless I mean I went to see a therapist for like two years I want to say straight on through yeah something like that there was no limit um the only reason I actually even stopped I was still in graduate school but that was because my therapist had retired Rebecca and so I went to see someone out of the school because I tried someone there and didn't like him um anyway okay so that, that's my advice really is to you're not you don't have to deal with it all on your own you need to get some professional support because those aren't friends and your mom is having her own tough time and you're gonna need some someone to assist you to get out of this enmeshment or maybe codependent type situation that you're in, because that's, I think that's how you were raised. I think that your parents never, never demonstrated healthy boundaries, never uh, offered you emotional attunement or help you understand emotion regulation. They didn't model any of that healthy behavior. I'm not surprised your mom has her own mental illnesses that she's dealing with. So we need to get you professional support. And that's key and get you out of that living situation as soon as possible. If you're still on the lease, you know, offer to replace your slot with someone else or whatever. There's There are ways to get you out of there um, or at least spend as little time as possible there. Okay. Now there's another question. It says, I can really relate to this. I have avoidant personality disorder and it's so hard to even imagine talking to people in real life. I basically have no friends and I'm trying to get better at talking with people, but I struggle to even let myself talk to someone new or even with acquaintances. How do you go about it if you're terrified to talk to people but want this connection so badly, but you're only standing in your own way? And what can I do to not let my failure pull me down for weeks? Okay, so if you guys don't know, avoidant personality disorder is interesting. I I guess I'm curious because the person who asked this question says that I have this, but then it's like you you want the connection so badly. So I would I would be curious if that's the proper diagnosis because from my understanding, avoidant personality disorder is someone who actually enjoys being alone and it feels better for them to be alone. So I might think that this, it could be a false diagnosis. Again, I'm not here to diagnose you or undiagnose you. I'm just curious about that. And so anyway, just wondering. So there's that. And then how do you go about it? I find the best way to go about meeting new people and doing new things is through shared activities. Now, this could mean that we take a class, right? Like maybe we want to learn about, uh, we want to learn Spanish. 
Maybe we want to learn guitar. Maybe we just want to go hiking more. Whatever it is, I think we can find a group of people doing that, whether that's through some local YMCA's or I don't know, a local gym or meetup.com or I don't know, there's a ton of different ways to get connected to people and to get involved in our local areas. We often just have to look at bulletin boards, get online, start looking around. But consider, or churches, if you're involved in your church, there's usually a lot of activities that way as well. I'm trying to think of other things. Um, Yeah, the YMCA, or, and I mean, I've met people through my yoga studios for years. Again, it doesn't have to be something like physically active like that. Like I said, it could be Uh, We want to learn how to knit. We want to learn guitar. We want to take a pottery class. We want to learn a foreign language. I find in those types of scenarios where we're like all learning something together, and hopefully there's like a group project, we have time to get used to seeing these people. We have time to get to know people little by little. There's no pressure to like go out for a happy hour with some friends from work and like strike up conversation and try to be cool. There's no pressure in this short amount of time. We have, you know, weeks and weeks and weeks to get to know people slowly but surely. And I find for those of us who are a little more anxious or a little more avoidant, right, that's better for us. And that that gives us an opportunity to show them who we really are, which is an amazing, wonderful person who just wants connection like everybody else without the pressure that could shut us down. And so that's really my advice. That's how I encourage people to go about meeting new people is by trying something new. And that's why it's great if we were taking like a beginner course of something, because we're all at that same level where we like don't know anything and we're just trying to learn. And I think that that's really cool. So that's really my my best encouragement is to get involved in some kind of group, or if there's even like um, some volunteering, like I met a lot of people through my volunteer work at downtown LA back before Sean and I moved to Austin. I used to volunteer at a few soup kitchens in downtown and I would get to meet all sorts of people from all different walks of life. And obviously they're the people who are court mandated to do their community service, but that doesn't mean they're bad people. And there's also a ton of people who just, that's what they do. A lot of retired people. Anyway, super fun groups. I encourage you to do that stuff as well. That's really the best way I think is through shared activities because then there's no pressure to like come up with things to say. And, and it also is a great confidence builder because we're all learning something together if we're taking a class. It's like we're building mastery through, you know, just doing that. So anyways, those are my thoughts. And if anybody has any other advices for people who struggle, kind of feel like they're standing in their own way to making connections, what's helped you? Let us know in those comments down below. Oh, and then the final part, they said, what can I do to not let my failure pull me down for weeks? First of all, I think doing things like group activities, like whether it's a class or, you know, volunteering is setting you up for success. But also I'd be very curious if we struggle with a little bit of depression, because when you say weeks, when it affects us for weeks, to me, that's a red flag, a potential depression. So if if you're not seeing a therapist, I would encourage you to see someone. Since you said you have avoidant personality disorder, I would assume you've seen a professional at one point or another. I would let them know this is happening. But what I assume is happening is our negative thought spirals are getting out of control and we're not able to stop them. And ways we can stop those thought spirals is number one, we have to notice that they're happening quickly, as quickly as possible. It's going to be difficult, but we can get better as we try it, right? So start to notice. Then we need to um, pay attention to a few of these like repeat thoughts And we need to argue back with more neutral thoughts, those bridge statements I've talked about. And if it feels like I can't even come up with even a neutral statement, like maybe I'm not as stupid as I think I am, or I'm open to things maybe aren't not be, things aren't as bad, maybe, maybe as I am perceiving them to be. If we can't even get there, then we might just need to distract. And that's okay too. Just make sure these distractions are helpful, not hurtful. Meaning they can be things like go for a walk, uh, get online with some positive support, journal, uh, color, uh, organize something in our home, take a shower, fold our clothes, any number of things, just getting ourselves out of our heads and stopping that spiral. Okay. Let's move on to question number two. This question says, hi, Katie. I'm curious about why we would imagine bad things happening to us. I think we had a question kind of about this last week, didn't we? It says, often I imagine I'm being hurt. Not identical scenarios to past traumas, but similar themes. 
I've been curious about this for a while and have noticed I tend to lean into it when my self-harm and eating disorder aren't really helping enough, almost as a punishment. Interesting. But the kinds of places it leads me to, I'm too embarrassed to tell my therapist, but these thoughts feel traumatizing and leave me a mess. I'd love to know your thoughts or advice. Thank you. And there's some comments on this, but this is incredibly common. And a couple reasons. Now, number one, our we are extreme, extremely resilient creatures. And our brain tries to give us new opportunities to process past trauma. And it does that by trying to replay a similar scenario or the exact same scenario, hence like flashbacks and body memories and and replaying things like and uh, imagining bad things happening to us. Our brain is trying to give us another chance to make sense of what happened and process it. And so that's most likely what I would assume is happening here is that there's still something that's upsetting, triggering, traumatizing, or whatever. And we're in a place in our life where we are finally okay enough to start this process of working through our trauma. And so our brain's just kicking these scenarios up to try to give us yet another opportunity to, you know, figure it out, if that makes sense. Okay. So that's one of the main reasons I think. Also, I have had patients utilize traumatizing scenarios in imagination or even through dreams, ask, using it kind of as a way to self-injure. And I'm also curious if that's what's happening here because you said you te- tend to lean into it when those things aren't helping enough when you're eating disorder and self-injury aren't like quote unquote doing their jobs, right? They're not giving us the coping that we're hoping for. So we're moving into yet another way to, to do that. Does that make sense? And so my encouragement for you is to tell your therapist at least a little bit. I know you said you're too embarrassed to tell, you know, tell them about all these thoughts. Is there something we could say to our therapist that would feel not so embarrassing? Maybe we say something like, you know, um, sometimes, you know, myself, if they already know about your eating disorder and your self-harm, which I hope they do, but you could say, you know, when my self-harm and my eating disorder just don't really calm me. Sometimes I just find my mind wandering into hurtful situations and I find that soothing. Like, could we say that? I know they're going to have follow-up questions and know that it's okay in therapy at a certain point to say, I I can't talk about that right now, or I'm too embarrassed. I don't want to talk about that. That's okay. As a therapist, I've had plenty of patients say things like that. I take notes of it and I say, is it okay if we circle back later? And usually my patients say, yeah, or maybe, or um, I don't know, you know, but at least I'm aware that this is like a soft spot. I can, we can revisit it in a different way. I'll try to ask a different kind of question to get in there. Um, But it kind of starts that conversation so that you're putting that out there because the more we tell our therapist, the more they can help us. So I'd encourage you to try to find a way to tell your therapist some of this, even if it's just 10% of what's going on. Um, but I want you to know, we hear stuff like this all the time. You're not weird. You're not broken. Nothing's wrong with you. This is just helpful information because of the things I said before, there's different reasons why we do this and it's incredibly common. And so the fact that they're like similar themes, I I honestly think your brain's trying to work through what happened to you in the past. And the sooner we can tell our therapist, the better, but those are kind of my thoughts. Okay. There was a comment on this says, what about wanting to be hurt or injured? I often think about suicidal ideation and deep down, I think I want to be cared for or want attention. It's very common, very normal. I often think about the word attention as a bad thing and I'm too nervous to tell my therapist thoughts. I just recorded a video. It hasn't gone live. Oh no, it did go live. I forgot about attention and how people think attention is a bad word. It's a, the video is called trigger words because I had tough, tough time sometimes I can't come up with titles because I was, it was words that people think are bad, but they're actually good. And attention is one of those. Attention is something we all need. FYI, it's a human need. We are primed. We're wired for connection to others, meaning that we're going to need attention from others. Even think about children. We cry for attention so that our needs can get met. Attention is something that we all need. And so you uh, wanting to be hurt or injured, I would assume comes from the urge to be cared for and to have someone actually pay attention to you because my guess would be you were either abused as a kid, or, uh, either physically, sexually, or my, like what I'm assuming it is, was neglect. And neglect is abuse, by the way, a lack of care is abuse. And so 
this want to be hurt or injured is because we keep hoping, again, our brain gives us another opportunity to try to heal from a trauma. We keep hoping someone will come to our aid, bandage us up or hold us tight, tell us it's going to be okay and tend to our wound, whatever that wound may be, right? And I've had patients, you know, uh, want to be hurt or injured in bigger ways. Like I just wish something, you know, extremely traumatizing would happen to me. So then I had a, I, it was like warranted for me to reach out for help. Does that make sense? Almost as if just being around and being a human isn't enough. We, you know, we have to have a real reason for ha- getting attention and wanting it. It has to be validated by another experience. And I'm here to tell you that it doesn't. We are all deserving of care attention, love, and support. It's basic human needs. It's okay to say that you need it. It's okay to ask for it. And it's most importantly, it's okay for you to get it. So those are my thoughts. Um, If because you're having a tough time telling your therapist, I'd encourage you to maybe write it down, see if you can email them in between sessions, maybe leave it as a voicemail, maybe give it to them as a letter. Um, Anything to get that out there would be really helpful because what what you're going through is extremely common. They're not going to think anything's wrong with you. And I think it'll be really helpful in the therapeutic process because that need for attention, like I said, it already is to me, I'm like, ooh, do we have abuse in our past? Or hmm, maybe we were neglected. That was the type of abuse. It kind of gives me as a therapist more information and it can help guide our treatment because then my steps would be how, how to set up scenarios where you can offer yourself the care and attention that you so desperately needed as a child. And I might even dive in a little bit to that inner child work and offering ourselves healing good parent messages, things like, I see you, I'm glad you're here, you're important. Like having you weave those into your journal entries or um, into your you know thoughts that you have, whether they're good or bad or whatever, try to feed those into it. I would have a lot of different tools and techniques for you. And so that'll be helpful for your therapist to know if we can just find a way for you to get it out. Okay, now there was a final, it says might be an add-on. I worked through my trauma, but I have these thoughts that are left and they're just not, they're not just reliving trauma, but also creating new horrible things in my head. How can I get rid of them? I acknowledge them, but they still come and are scary. I have a feeling we have something left in there that needs to be processed. This might mean that EMDR is the route we go because talk therapy got us like 90% of the way, but these, you know, thoughts that are hanging around or ruining it for us might need somatic experiencing or some kind of movement through while we talk through things. Those could all be potential options or we might just need to bring these up, these leftover thoughts, bring these up in therapy and try to figure out what they're attached to and why they're happening and are, because you said they're really scary and they still come around. Is it another scenario we haven't talked through or an emotion or a sensation or something we haven't processed or on another end, just because I'm curious, I've had patients who feel like if they are all better, you know, quote unquote, all better, we process through our trauma, then they're not deserving of care. So they're like, well, I still want to be in therapy. So I must still have to have something wrong with me. I've had patients struggle with that all the time. And I'm here to tell you that we all are deserving of care. I go to therapy. I mean, I need to find a therapist now. I've had trouble finding someone who has any openings, um, but I'm on it. Um, but I've been in and out of therapy since I was 15 and I've never you know, been directly processing a trauma or never had an eating disorder, never used self-harm, but I still know that I deserve care and I deserve to see someone. Um, And that reminds me to make another call because I have a couple more people I'm going to try today. Each week I try a few, so I will find someone. Um, Anyways, so just considering that and where that's coming from for you, you know, that could help guide your treatment and help you come to a place where you don't have these, you know, quote unquote, leftover thoughts. Okay, let's move on to question three. This question says, Hi, Katie. I recently listened to an episode where you described looking into the past too long as a form of self-harm by impending, impeding healing. Is there ever a point where you can look back at a life-forming event that was in some way traumatic without it impeding healing? Yes. If so, is it all about framing it? We'll talk about that. I'm conscious that people can find comfort in past pain because even though it's painful, it's familiar and therefore comfortable. Yes. However, I'm not sure where the line gets drawn of simply looking back and reflecting or dwelling too heavily. Thank you for the podcast. I started a few months ago from episode one and have really been enjoying it. Oh, yay. That's wonderful. Welcome to the community. 
Now, this is a great question. And the truth is that looking into the past isn't, isn't a bad thing. The thing that can be bad and what impedes our healing is if we live in the past, meaning we spend all our time there. I think that uh, considering past experiences, I don't know. I mean, it's you can't give like a numerical, like one day a week you consider. I'm trying to think of the last time because I lost my grandma recently. I've thought about past things more, um, I think, because it's just grief. So, you know, depending on what's going on in your life, I think it's normal to reflect back or to have like Sean and I'll be having a conversation watching a TV show or something like, oh my God, remember that summer when we did X, Y, or Z, right? You have recollections of events. But if we are only going back to the traumatizing ones, I have a couple of thoughts. Number one, like I said, it can be a form of self-harm to impede our healing. And that means it's done when we don't have other ways to cope. So if you notice yourself only doing this when you, I don't know, like, when you actually would self-harm or use your eating disorder behavior or maybe dive into suicidal thoughts or drink or do drugs or shop, like, are we doing it as a way to cope? Pay attention to that because that will tell us a little bit more about it. Or are we doing it because we still need to process it? Like I was talking about before, we can play and replay old scenarios because our brain is like, hey, I still need to process through this. I still need to uh, make sense of this or to file this away and get it out of my head, right? It can still, it could still be hanging around and need more work. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so that's really the line that's drawn. That's where I, that's what I try to pay attention to is, are we doing it to help us cope? Or are we doing it because we still feel like there's something there that needs to be worked through and no judgment either way. But then that will tell us what our next step of treatment is. Meaning, do we need more trauma work? Like, do we need to work on healing or processing through that trauma we sustained? Or do we need to come up with other coping skills to assist so that we don't feel this urge to self-harm or to cope with it? Does that make sense? And so it's like, that can help us decide like what the next stages are. Um, and let me see, is there ever a point where you can look back at, oh, and the last thing I wanted to say is that it's totally normal to look back at life-forming events, even if they're traumatic and horrible. The difference is, is that when we do it, when when we're doing it from a healthy, safe place, is that we look back at it and there's no emotional charge attached to it, meaning that, yes, we're like, oh, that was painful. And we can maybe feel a little flicker of that emotion, but we're like, I'm just glad I'm not there anymore. <sighs> right? It's like we're able to reflect back and then move forward. And it, we don't get caught in it because it doesn't have that emotional, there's no entanglement in our emotions anymore. It's, I mean, I can talk about things that happened to me in the past and I'm like, oh, and I can even reflect and be like, wow, I remember how difficult that was for me. But a lot of times, especially now, since it's been longer and I've talked about it in therapy to, I'm like sick of it is I'll say, you know, it was really painful, but I'm actually kind of glad because then it led me to make this decision, which led me here. And then, you know, all leads up to where I am now. So, so yeah, so there are those types of things. And so it's not really, it could be about framing it, but I think it's more about our, how we experience it when we do reflect back. Okay. Now there's, let's move on to question number four, because there, there weren't any questions under that one. It says, hey, Katie, ever since I was a child, I used to go to a fantasy world that I created in my mind when I wasn't feeling safe. Well, I'm still doing this at 25 and I feel very ashamed because of it. My therapist asked whether I could tell her what happens there, which is usually some bad and endangering stuff. I really want to, but I just can't bring myself to open up because of the shame that I'm feeling. Do you have any tips on how I could manage this? Thank you. There are a lot of comments on this um, right in line with where I'm going with this. What this is, is it's, it's called maladaptive daydreaming. That's what this sounds like. Now, it's interesting that during your daydreams, you're doing bad or endangering stuff. So I'd be kind of curious about that as your therapist. Um, but maladaptive daydreaming isn't always a happy, safe place either. It's, I'm just, that would tell us more about like what's happened in our past and what you're trying to do to kind of manage it now. So maladaptive daydreaming, I have a lot of videos about it. I have a, I want a, a recent video, maybe like in the last six months about it. So I would encourage you just to get onto YouTube and put maladaptive daydreaming, Katie Morton, and my video will come up. Um, 
it, we create this other space as kind of an escape from our reality for whatever reason. It could be another way to process through what we've been through. Usually it's a way to, I don't know, get away from the flashbacks or trauma or upsets that we experience in our real life. That's the most common, but that doesn't mean it's the only way that it can be experienced. And there's no age limit on it. I know we think of daydreaming as something kids do in school, but adults do it too. And I've had people start doing it at like the ripe age of 40. I've had people that have been doing it since they were a child all the way until adulthood. There's no judgment around timing and how long. It's incredibly common. And I kind of place it, and people might agree or disagree, but I kind of place on this spectrum of dissociation and maladaptive daydreaming is like here, you know, then we have DPDR, depersonalization, derealization, um, and there's dissociative amnesia associated with those. And then on the other end of the spectrum is dissociative identity disorder, what otherwise um, used to be known as multiple personality disorder. So you can see kind of a spectrum of these things. And so I think what is really happening is maladaptive daydreaming and like I said, I have videos about it, so there'll be more tools and techniques in those videos. However, my tips on it is if you're able to tell your therapist, well, it sounds like you're telling your therapist it happens. Maybe try to give it a name. Say I listened to this weird therapist online and she was saying it could be maladaptive daydreaming. Have you heard of this? Um, and talk to them about it. I My best advice about getting out of it or preventing it we can do things called grounding techniques. Those are used in all forms of dissociation to help keep us present and prevent us from being pulled into these other realities. And that can be something like counting colors, meaning you look around the room, how many things are brown, how many things are green. You do that, you can do the ABC game where you look around the room, things that start with a letter A, B, C, et cetera. Um, then we could also change the temperature, like splash cold water on our face or put a cold rag on our neck, hold ice cubes, things like that. There's a ton of different things that we can do. We can do full body shakes just to like reset our nervous system. But I find that grounding techniques work, but we're going to have to know or be able to notice when we're wanting to pull into that daydreaming. Like, can we notice when our mind wants to go there? It's like, uh, can we feel that tractor beam? And can we then do the grounding technique? Because it's going to take a little practice to get to know that. Okay. And then the final tip I have, and this has worked for a few of my patients, it doesn't mean it's going to work for everybody, but sometimes I would have them in session. I would talk them through their space. And I know you're not there to tell her what happens, but you can maybe tell her what it looks like. And I always ask my patients, I'm like, can we build a door together? And if you go through that door, you let yourself out. Um, and I know it sounds a little woo woo, but it's been pretty effective. And it can make it a really ornate door. It can be like one of those hide a doors. One of my uh, patients is a, a guy really liked the hide a door idea. Can we come up with some some way to put a door in your daydream that will let you out and brings you back to reality? That's another option. But anyways, I have those videos with more information. But there was a comment on this and it says, I do this as well. It's called maladaptive daydreaming and it's a form of dissociation in response to trauma. Some people daydream safe places. Others might imagine bad things happening to them. Yes, yes, yes. I experience the latter. I often daydream things worse than my trauma and imagine having support in my healing journey that I don't have now. That's the good part. That's actually the healing part of your maladaptive daydreaming. Katie, do you think this is this could be an effort to process through experience experiences and validate the seriousness of the trauma? Um, uh, oh, of the trauma of the daydreamer. In this case, me endured. I've been doing it since I was 11 and I'm 23 now and the daydream has remained mostly the same. Yes, I think it's your brain, again, trying to give you yet another way to feel validated and supported. And that's why it's a daydream, right? Even though something bad is happening, you're still offering yourself that positive, loving support and, and validation that you aren't getting in real life. So I always feel like our dissociation serves a purpose. Either it's a break from reality, almost always, but we can also feel... Uh, protected or safer there, or maybe just at least neutral. And then in this case, it can also be a way to offer ourselves something we're not getting in our real life, which is that support and validation. And so I feel like it's it's your way of, I would bring this up in therapy. I find this really interesting and helpful because it's almost like you're doing that inner child work in your daydream, but we have to bring it into reality so that we can kind of cement it and have it be part of your healing process. Because if you don't know, when we are dissociated, we're not always able to process traumas and to form any health, like to form holistic memories. So it can be, 
in, almost like we're working against ourselves. So if we're dissociated while we're trying to process a trauma, some of that work may not be captured. So it's like we're working against ourselves and not actually um, processing something fully. So yeah, I think that it's a way for you to validate and to support. And I think it's also kind of like part of your healing process. But again, I'd want to bring it out of the daydream and into reality. Um, maybe finding ways or just let's maybe consider some of the ways you could offer those things that are in your daydream to yourself in your real life, whether that's through, you know, messages or letters to ourselves now, or whether that's through like some basic self-care stuff, or maybe that's through trying to find a therapist or see about, you know, cheaper free options. Like what actions can we take to offer ourselves what we're really needing? Okay. Let's move on to question number five. This question says, hi, Katie. My question pertains to inner child work and emotion regulation. I record my virtual therapy sessions to help myself remember and process what we work on each week. It's my therapist's suggestion. Yeah, that can be really great. Um, I've had even people on my Patreon who do hangouts with me every month want to record them. And that's always fine Um, because it can be helpful, right? We can go back then if something really resonated, we can listen to it again. Uh, But when I get stuck in a depressive spiral, I... I rewatch and rewatch and rewatch the portions of my sessions when my therapist was especially gentle, kind, or comforting. I pay, I pay close attention to my therapist's caring tone, a voice, facial expressions, absorbing every single shred of kindness that I can find. My therapist is wonderful, and she has helped me work through so much. I have anxious attachment, depression, and anxiety from massive childhood emotional neglect. I've gotten so much better at self-regulating, but sometimes when the hurt is too deep, I rely on those recordings of my therapist to give me comfort. Oh, give me the comfort I desperately crave, but I don't feel safe asking for in real life. I know I can't make my therapist fill the mother wound and that I need to learn to ask for comfort from trusted friends. But until I can work up that courage, is it wrong to use these recordings to find comfort? Or is it an acceptable way to self-soothe? I think it's incredibly acceptable and I'm so glad you have these. This is wonderful and beautiful. I think there are a couple of things though. Keep doing it. I'm glad you have. It's a, it's a resource. I see it as a resource. My as a therapist, I'm just always a little nervous about my patients only having one resource and it being me because um I want you to have more variety. Now, it doesn't mean that that those tapes aren't effective. It sounds like they're super effective. However, I want what my encouragement and my homework for you would to be first, as a therapist, I want to validate you. I want to tell you it's completely okay. I'm glad you have it. Just like I was saying, this is wonderful. It's totally acceptable. There's nothing wrong with this. Not even a little bit, not even 1% wrong. It's 100% right and correct. And I'm glad you have it. However, we need to challenge ourselves to find other support options because it's going to be so easy to go back to this for comfort. And if we only have that one, it can make it difficult for us to A, give it to ourselves, self-soothe, you know, the key words being self-soothe. Number two, from having other people we can reach out to because different people in our lives serve different purposes. Like I was talking about in question number one about different friendships and wanting to get out there and see people. We can't rely on one person to give us everything. We'll always be let down. We're all human and we're flawed and we're not available and we need to go on vacations and things happen. And so we need to have a variety. So my encouragement to you would be keep doing what you're doing. And then also consider picking out one trusted friend And maybe next time you want to play those tapes, you only play it once, then you reach out to a friend. Just a little bit, just to see. Doesn't mean they have to offer anything, but we need to start practicing how we ask for the support and seeing what kind of support we get back. And yes, with friends, it's give and take. Unlike therapy, that's what makes therapy so special. But we might have to say, you know, I'm having a tough time, just wanted to chat. Do you have a minute? And they might not. Or we might chat with them and vent about what we're going through. And then it's important that we say, okay, how about, how are you doing? We need to check in with them, give them an opportunity to vent if they need to, or to find some comfort in us. So I encourage you to challenge that and reach out a little bit. It doesn't mean that we, again, cannot have that support. We still have it, but we need to start building one brick at a time, these other pillars of our support system. And I think that's a great way to start but I'm so glad you have those. It's beautiful. Keep doing it. I'm glad it's soothing you. And then the next step out outside of that might be to help you find some ways to regulate on your own without friends, without your therapist. 
And that might be part of like the good mother messages. That book, I should have brought it out here, but I have a few books because I'm working on an inner child workshop right now. But the book, uh, The Emotionally Unavailable Mother, it's by a woman, I think her name is like Jody or Jory. Uh, it's a blue, it's a teal book. It's in my Amazon shop. So go to amazon.com forward slash shop forward slash Katie Morton. It'll be in there. Um, couldn't recommend it more. Um, and I'm also going to add, I'm looking at a new workbook and if I love it, I'm going to add it to that too. And it has a ton of inner child activities that we can do. Long story short, you're doing great. Let's just challenge ourselves to try to, you know, find ways to self, to soothe on our own, self-soothe, and then start building a little bit of those connections with friends. Okay, now there was a comment on this and it's it's not really related, but it's kind of related because it's talking about like the therapeutic relationship. And it says, how do I stop myself from spiraling after therapy, like a day after help? I thought this was a great way to kind of not even wrap up, but to talk about therapy as a whole and the reasons that it's important to tell our therapist when we're having difficulty like this. If we're feeling dysregulated, or overwhelmed or spiraling after session, that's critically important that you tell your therapist because there are a couple things that we can do. Number one, as a therapist, I might consider, do you need more than one session a week or one session every other week or however, how whatever the frequency of our sessions are at the moment, I may consider increasing it potentially. Or number two, I might want us to finish our emotionally heavy work. Let's say we're doing trauma processing. Then I and I've been giving you like a 10 minute wind down, maybe I need to move that to 15 minutes, maybe 20, right? We need to maybe give more time for you to debrief, calm your system before you go out into the world. Or third, and this probably finally, but I'm sure there might be more that would come into my mind later. But third and finally for right now is I would consider, oh, maybe you need to have some more tools or resources for the rest of that day. Because I have tons of patients over the years where I've said, okay, since our session's are so dysregulating, I want you to put a plan together for the rest of your day after. Even if that plan is, I'm going to pick up dinner, I'm going to get into cozy clothes, I'm going to watch reruns of my favorite show, and I'm going to go to bed early. That's a plan. So figuring out how we can help ourselves feel okay and to have structure and to be, it's kind of soothing. And so I'm going to try to find those things. So those are some of the ways that I would approach that if I was your therapist, but you need to let your therapist know because there are going to be a couple things there, like the an increasing frequency of sessions or uh, giving you more time to like ramp off into the world, more like decompression, or I don't even know what I'd call it, I guess debriefing time at the end of session, they're going to need to do all that. And they can't do it if we don't let them know that this is happening. Okay, with that, let's move on to question number six. This question says, hi, Katie, how can we stay in the quote unquote, healthy eating habits path? Hmm. I feel like I have too emotional, oh, too many emotional attachments to food. I love different cuisines. I love desserts. I love eating out and I love trying all new flavors. So I adore eating overall. That's wonderful. I try to recognize patterns. For example, when I reward myself with food after a long and hard day, how can I recognize what is normal and what is unhealthy? Thank you for all that you do. Hugs from Hungary. Um, Hello, hello. All the way from Hungary. That's one of the places on my list to visit. Okay. So staying in the healthy eating habits path, if you if you don't know, I'm a huge fan of what is known as intuitive eating. Now, intuitive eating means that we eat when we're hungry and we stop when we're full and we check in with ourselves because we don't want to let our emotions rule our bodies and really overrule what our body needs because emotions can make us not eat and can make us overeat. It can cause us to restrict or binge or purge or all sorts of things, right? And so the fact that you love food, you love different cuisines, me too. Love desserts, me too. I love eating out, yes. And new flavors, that's wonderful. So you find a lot of pleasure in food. There's nothing wrong with that. But I want you to check in on your with yourself before and probably in the middle of eating and then after. And I'd encourage you, actually, if you feel comfortable to pick up the Intuitive Eating Workbook, it's in my Amazon store as well, the amazon.com forward slash shop forward slash Katie Martin. You can find it in there. I love it. It has you rank on a level of zero to 10, or I think it's one to 10. Anyways, a scale of, let's say, zero to 10. 10 being I'm so full if I bend over, I'm going to throw up. Um, Zero or one being I'm so hungry, I could like gnaw my arm off, right? 
and we want to start eating or planning to eat, preparing food and stuff around like a five, we want to eat by a four, and we want to stop when we're sevens, like perfect, eights, like one bite too many. So for my more restrictive p- patients, I always say, I want you to get to an eight. And for my binge eaters, I want them to stick at a seven. And, you know, we just try to work on it. Pay attention. There's no judgments around this. I just want you to check in. Remember, we're going to be curious, not judgmental. Are we overeating or undereating in certain scenarios? That's really it. That's all I'm worried about. Are there healthy eating habits? Uh, sure, there's a new diet online every week, every day, pr- practically. I don't like the idea of good or bad foods. I truly believe if we would stop thinking about what we're eating and we would just listen to our bodies, we'd all be healthier and happier. Um, Obviously, if you like consider this, you guys, I know some of you are like, if I listen to my my body, I'm going to get fat and I'm going to binge eat all sorts of stuff. Okay, sure, maybe. Um, How many of us could eat pizza every day for two weeks, every day, every meal, even. I couldn't even do it for one, well, maybe one day. And then I'd be like, I'm so sick of it, right? I might want something crunchy then like a salad, or I might want a sandwich, or I might want, uh, you know, fajitas, something different, right? We get bored of food really quick, not to mention sweets. Who could eat chocolate bars for every meal all day long? Nobody. I'll never forget when I was a kid, and this might be why I don't really love candy so much. I love desserts like brownies, cakes, but not like candy. I kept trying to get into the candy from Halloween when I was little, and my mom kept catching me. She was only allowing us to have, let's say, like one one little candy bar thing after every meal. So we got like three or four a day, let's say. Well, little Katie was like, that's not enough. I want it like all day, every day. And so my mom's like, okay, well, sit down. I want you to eat all of this. And she put all my Halloween candy out in front of me. And it, I don't know how much it was, but it, I was like, oh yeah. You guys, I got through like half of it and was like, I don't feel good. I never, ugh, did not want it after that. So that just goes to show kids are really intuitive. Kids don't have judgment around food. So for me, I was like, sweet, sweet, sweets. Yes, yes, yes. My mom was like, sure, eat it all. And I was like, can't, <laughs> right? So just think about that. We really can't. If we truly listen to our bodies, it will tell us when to stop. Now, there's no good or bad food. There's just food. And if we listen, we will be able to eat different flavors, different cuisines, eat dessert when you want. It's There's no judgments. Our society places so much judgment on the food that we eat. That's what's like fucked us up. And so I'm just here to tell you that... What is normal is eating when we're hungry, stopping when we're full, and enjoying our food. Now, I am always a little resistant to rewarding ourselves with food after a long day. I don't think there's anything wrong with, because I used to do this sometimes when I'd, I'd have like 10 patients in a row in my practice, and I would walk, I forget the name of this restaurant, but it used to be on the corner um, of 26 and Wilshire, like on my way home. And I would swing in there and I'd get like a nice meal they had this like black, this uh, cod dish that was really delicious. And anyway, so I'd get that and I'd get a cocktail and then I'd walk the rest of the way home. So I'd like eat my meal and it wasn't, it was kind of me treating myself, but it was more like, I don't have to get home and try to figure out what to eat. I don't have to, you know, it was like a way of taking care of myself. So I'd be curious about that because rewarding ourselves, you know, I think it's more like I'm going to feed myself. Is there, are there other ways you could reward yourself after a long day? Because I, I might encourage you to try to find other things to do, unless it's like a really nice meal. Like that was, for me, those were a little more expensive. Like I wouldn't have normally spent like 20 bucks on a meal. So that could be a way that you um, do that. But anyways, those are my thoughts. Um, Healthy eating habits really just means that we're eating every three to four hours. We're eating when we're hungry. We're stopping when we're full. I think there is a lot to eating a protein, a carb, and a veggie or a fruit with every meal. That keeps us full longer. It ensures that we're getting a variety of nutrients. That's really it. And I think a lot of us numb out and don't check in. And so we end up either overeating, undereating, or not eating what our body craves. Therefore, we're not satisfied. And then we want to eat more again. Um, Yeah. Does that make sense? I hope so. But also in the vein of checking when you're hungry or if you're, you know, checking in with your hunger fullness, it, it can also be helpful to check in with our emotional hunger and fullness because that can sometimes, you know, affect the hunger. 
Here's a comment on this. It says, is there something like healthy food rules? No. Or is that just an eating disorder in disguise? Yes. Like having to eat the whole apple. Oh, interesting. Needing to eat the whole plate because otherwise it will be an eating disorder. Now that I'm writing this, I'm thinking about it. It's maybe more an OCD trait. It 100% is, but I'm still interested in what your thoughts are. Okay. So health food, healthy food rules, I was thinking are more like these are good f- foods, these are bad foods, and that's just disordered eating out the gate uh, because th- like I said, there's no good or bad foods, there's just food. And I know people are probably screaming as they listen to this thinking that that's wrong. Like, well, we know, you know, processed foods aren't as good for you or whatever. Again, we're not going to sit down and eat only those things all the time. Our body's going to crave different things. The reason that we have all these quote unquote rules is because we're not listening to our bodies. Our brain is then just telling our body, no, this is what you're going to eat, which is probably why we don't feel satisfied. But anyway, okay, that's a whole nother and get on a soapbox with that. So if you have a bunch of rules around food, that's an eating disorder or at least some eating disorder behaviors, Okay. Now, when this person said like having to eat the whole apple or needing to eat the whole plate, I don't know if it's necessarily OCD. The way to know if something's OCD is if we think something bad is going to happen if we don't do the thing, the compulsion, meaning eat the whole apple, eat all the food on the plate. I have patients who are like this, and it's not so much OCD, it's more perfectionism, meaning that we don't do anything half-assed. We're black and white, baby. And since now we're in recovery, we're doing it fully 100%. And so I used to take my patients out and you guys are gonna hate this for those of you who have this type of eating disorder kind of structure. There was this Italian place next to my office called Earth, Wind and Flower. I used to take my patients there for meals out. I did therapeutic meals out. I know not all therapists do that, but I found it to be extremely telling. And uh, And part of the understanding would be that we would both order pasta because I knew their portions were ginormous. And no, you could not get the lunch size. You had to get the dinner, you had to get the full size because what I wanted my patients to do was to tell me when they were full. How much did you need to feel full? It's really hard, especially if we just do an all or nothing. Well, I just clean my plate. Well, you this isn't portioned. This is just eat, right? It can be extremely triggering and difficult. And so... Um, I'm curious if that's where this is coming for you from for you. And I would encourage you to maybe do one of those types of things, an outing where you get more food than you need, or maybe less and you have to order again. I've done that as I've done that as well, where we would split a sandwich knowing that then we're going to order something else. And what do you want as your something else? Mm, how much do you want to eat? Right. Again, knowing when we're hungry and knowing when we're full. And it takes practice if we've been so disconnected. I'm not saying this to say like, oh, it should be easy for you. No, it's difficult. And that's why I've done that work with my patients. And it's important for all of us as even non-eating disorder people to pay attention to hunger fullness because we can sometimes not do that and end up feeling too full or be hungry in two hours and wonder why we're hungry because we didn't eat until we were full. So those are my thoughts. But it would might be OCD if we worry that something bad is going to happen if we don't do the thing, but I think it might be more of your perfectionism, eating disorder type black and white kind of thinking. That's Those are just my thoughts. Okay, final add-on on this one says, could you talk more about the lines between normal and disordered eating and disordered eating and an eating disorder? Does everyone with disordered eating behavior have OSFED? And if not, what's the difference? Okay, so normal eaters truly do not give that much thought to food. Like I've, I've said this year over the years, but I know it's hard for people with eating disorders to like imagine not worry, being worried about food. Uh, but I'll just give, I always just give some personal examples. So Sean and I went out to the lake, not this last weekend, but the weekend before. And I was hungry because we'd, we'd been swimming around and we were wrestling with the dog and I'd brought some snacks like an apple and Belvita because I knew if I get I get hungry I get hangry you guys I get like low blood sugar boom and I'm grouchy so I always bring snacks so I'd ate the apple I'd ate the Belvita I'd give some of it to Sean I think and by the time we were off the lake I was like we gotta eat and so there's a place that was super super close to where we were parked and I was like okay we'll go there and I was looking and looking and I would order like a bacon cheeseburger because that's just what sounded good were there judgments around it no Did I consider whether I wanted sweet potato fries, regular fries, or their soup? Yes, I considered 
I asked what the soup was. I didn't want vegetables. I just didn't, it didn't sound good. So, and I don't really like sweet potato fries. Judge me if you want. Did I get regular fries? Yes, yes, I did. Did I give it more thought than that? No. Did I eat the whole thing? I actually didn't. It was way too filling. So I left like, I don't know, a few bites behind. That's normal eating. There was no uh, number counting. I was hungry. What sounded good? Did I want that or that? It was really, I was just considering, I was checking in with myself and how hungry am I? And I didn't even eat the whole thing because I got too full. That was it. So that's a normal eater. And if I'd gone to a party, let's say, and there were no quote unquote, you know, healthy foods there, I could still just eat and I would eat until I was full and then I'd be done. And that's it. And I know that sounds way too simple, but that's just the truth. Now, when it comes to disordered eating, disordered eating is really just a nice way of saying eating disorder behaviors that might not fit a diagnosis. And so would I say that every disordered eating person has OSFED? Yes, I would. Now, that's just me because that's eating disorder behavior. Now, the difference between disordered eating and eating disorder would honestly just be diagnostics. It'd mean that you're maybe not doing something X number of times to meet the criteria for bulimia or anorexia or binge eating disorder, right? We're just doing some of it. And I honestly believe a lot of people have those types of behaviors where where they only eat, um, I don't know, like things that are grown within a certain mile radius. I have lots of people I know from LA who only eat things, you know, lower our carbon footprint. Um, or only eat organic. And if they don't know where it's from, they won't eat. Um, Or, you know, I don't even know. It can't be cooked in oil. I don't do any oil. I mean, there's so many weird things that people will do with food as a way to soothe their system, right? It's a coping skill we have. And that's, I guess, I think that's really it. A disordered eating is just a behavior of an eating disorder that, you know, is just one of those symptoms and maybe it doesn't meet the full criteria so we don't call it oh that's bulimia we say oh that's disordered eating because they won't eat this or that or they'll only eat it this way or they have to cut this into a zillion pieces or they only eat while they stand up or i mean the number of things that i've come into contact with with my page they only eat on their own they don't like anybody watching them eat um they have rituals right you know there's so many things but maybe it just doesn't quite meet that criteria so that's that's really the difference i hope that's clear Let's move on to question number seven. This question says, Katie, why do some people gravitate towards healthy coping skill or, oh wait, healthy coping mechanisms and some people don't? I've been struggling. I just keep trading one bad coping skill for another. First eating disorders, then self-harm, then drinking. Once I realize what I'm doing is bad, I'll stop. But then a new one pops right back up. I get annoyed because it's like, why when Becky gets really upset, she can just go on a walk or do some meditation and then she's fine. I've tried healthy coping skills, but it doesn't help. I don't have trauma growing up. Everything was good. No neglect or anything bad. Why am I like this? How can I become more like Becky? Okay, so uh, this is, I love this question. I, I, it's, it's a very important question to talk about. And the, there, there, are two, there are two kind of veins I want to go in with this, okay? And the first is resilience. Some of us are born with more resilience than others. And yes, that just fucking sucks. But the cool thing is that we can build that up. It's like some of us being more athletic when we're born. It's like almost genetic. It's just good old fashioned resilience. And resilience, if you don't know the term, is like our ability to weather life's storms, meaning life can throw a bunch of shit at me and I can handle it. I'm okay. I can get through it, right? So there's that ways to build it up are things like taking care of our basic needs, eating regularly, getting enough sleep, taking care of any illness we might have, or taking medication as it's prescribed, you know, all of the things that we know, drinking water, yada, yada, basic stuff. Also, resilience could be finding a therapist, um, increasing our support system of friends and family, um, cleaning up our space that we have to work in because it helps us feel better. There's certain things we can do to just help ourselves uh, thrive. Okay, so there's that. And that's the first vein. Becky might have just been born with more resilience, but that doesn't mean we can't. We just have to build it up and work harder to get to where she was. Okay, so there's that. The second, so it's almost like nature versus nurture. So that's um, nurture. 
or no, I guess that'd be nature because it's like she's just born with more, right? Nurture is this other vein I want to go in. And that is the fact that Becky may have had parents who demonstrated healthy coping and encouraged her to do the same. Now, I don't know about you, but my parents weren't the best with emotion regulation and teaching me healthy ways to cope. Although my mom was incredibly great at at acknowledging emotions in my brother and I and giving us space to like feel them and be in them. Now, was she herself great at doing that for herself? No, but as a kid, I still felt free to talk about how I felt and what was going on and, and, and knew that it'd be validated and supported. My mom was incredibly nurturing. Now, my dad, on the other hand, was like super emotionally dysregulated all the time, would like cry easily and be hurt. He was super sensitive. And part of me wonders if if maybe he had borderline personality disorder, but I don't think there was any splitting. Um, I think he might've just been extreme. I think he's a highly sensitive person. And I wonder if I got that from him. So anyways, not to, you know, tell you about my my dad because he's not here to defend himself. Um, and he probably hated if he knew people knew how emotional he was, but because not all of us got to see emotions in our parents and got to experience the the sensations of it, be validated. And then the most important thing, modeling healthy emotional regulation skills. So let's say Becky's mom, when she would get upset, would say to Becky, I've had a hard day and I'm just feeling kind of sad. I'm going to go for a walk. Okay. Do you want to come with me? I don't want to talk on the walk, but you're welcome to join. Maybe there was that. Maybe Becky's dad taught her how to color or draw and doodle as a way to calm. He said, oh, I feel kind of uh, anxious today or stressed out. I'm going to doodle. Do you want to doodle with me? Maybe Becky's mom played the piano when she was stressed or played music as a way to cope. Parents, sometimes without realizing it, will model ways that they themselves soothe, doing yoga, meditation, journaling, doodling, playing music, going for a walk, playing with pets, organizing the home. And that modeling of emotion regulation skills is incredibly helpful in kids. Does that mean that you were neglected? No. Does that mean you were abused? No, if your parents didn't do that. That just means that your parents were emotionally immature or didn't have the emotional coping skills or regulation skills to pass them on to you, right? They didn't even have them to give. Now, that doesn't mean that we can't learn them and we can't model them for our own children if we decide to have them or change it for our life so we feel better. That, But again, it wasn't modeled early on, so we're kind of behind the eight ball on it, meaning we're going to have to teach it to ourselves, which is a little bit more difficult and we're older, right? We can want to go to those other unhealthy coping skills, And those new ones just don't feel as good. Why? I don't know. It's the reward center in our brain. You can blame it. That's why. But because these quote unquote bad coping skills, the maladaptive ones like drinking, self-injury, eating disorders, triggers like dopamine responses and adrenaline and cortisol and all that chemical essentially shit storm, but it makes us feel good a lot of times. And these healthy ones don't do that. They are more system regulating, if that makes sense. So that's why a lot of parents just did not model healthy behavior. And it's not, I'm not saying like, oh, always blame the parents. Like I said, there could be different things, like just being born with more resilience and having to work harder. But a lot of times I find that parents just aren't aware of how important it is to model healthy coping skills for our children and show them our emotional reaction and also what we can do to regulate and to cope. It's just so important. And you probably didn't get that. And so that's how you can become more like Becky, is you can learn new ways to regulate. You can try out these new healthy coping skills. Will they work as well? Probably not. But can you do five trials, wait 30 minutes, and then maybe at that point, maybe I will give you an opportunity to use the bad one anyway. I do that with my patients all the time. I'm like, try out the new ones, wait 30 minutes, and then do whatever the fuck you want. Because we have to try and try again. It's not perfect. It's not black and white, okay? You got this. Now, our final question, question number eight says, hey, Katie, happy Thursday. Happy Thursday. Says, I think I may have experienced some religious trauma. Oof. My question is, how do I figure out what I believe in and what my own beliefs are and unlearn what I have been taught through church and my upbringing? 
I hope this makes sense. Thanks for all that you do. It totally makes sense. And of course, so religious trauma, I think is way more common than we realize. Um, and for anybody who's wondering, you know, what religious trauma is, it, it's just like what it sounds like. It's when we've been traumatized through religious beliefs. And I mean, just think about it, for instance, like being told that if you don't save yourself for marriage, you're never going to find a good partner. Being told that who you love or who you are isn't acceptable, right? Especially in the LGBTQ plus community, we could have been told that we're not acceptable. Trauma, hello. Um, Also being told that we have to act and do in just a certain way. And if we don't, we're going to burn in hell. Hello, trauma. There's there's tons more. We get into purity culture and all that stuff. It's, it can be it can be incredibly toxic. In the same way, religion can be incredibly structured and helpful in a wonderful, beautiful community. But just like anything that's good, there can be a dark side to it as well. And so, if you think you've experienced some religious trauma, I would encourage you to spend some time on your own, going inside, considering your belief system. If you have relied heavily on the Bible and readings, I might encourage you to get a new Bible. I know that sounds weird, but there's something. I remember my mom encouraging me to do this when I was younger. I had this like teen Bible and my mom got me a new Bible and she was like, I feel like you just need a fresh start. And there was something about that. It's, it's kind of beautiful. Um, if for any of you know, I was raised in church, but I don't, I don't believe anymore and I don't attend anymore um, and to each their own. But I think sometimes getting a new Bible can help you feel free to interpret it in the way that you want. And I guess my goal here would be for you to start your own journey to religion without the like voice of of maybe potential people who cause some of this trauma. So I want it to be like on its own. And this can be through, you know, reading scripture, prayer spending time on your own, doing reflections, journaling, all of that I think will be incredibly healing and part of this process. But I think to figure out what you believe in, take a minute to consider what you agree with, what you think you agree with. And then if we only agree because we feel guilty, if we don't, I don't know if you're going to be able to tease that out, but that's where my brain goes is, and I'm trying to think of how to describe what, what that would feel like. Like, okay, for instance, let's say that I believe in equality between man and woman, which I obviously do. And I read in the Bible because there's a scripture and I forget where it is, where it says how the woman should be subservient to her husband and blah, 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 blah. I forget the language, yada, yada, but he should also respect his wife. And I read that and I'm like, no, I don't agree with that. I don't believe in that. Or maybe I'm like, well, I guess that is right. Because if I don't believe in that, then maybe I don't even believe in God. And then maybe I'm not even going to go to heaven. That's guilt driven. Does that make sense? I know that might be a shitty example, but that's just the best I can come up with right now off the top of my head. And that's kind of where I encourage you to spend time. And it's okay to not know. um, But I really believe in like fresh, if, if we want religion to still be part of our life, because that's also a good question for you to answer. Again, no judgments. I think a lot of people who had religious trauma don't know a life without religion and can feel very lost without it. And it can feel very healing to have a supportive community around you. I support all of those things. But for a lot of us, we can feel like, well, it's just a place where manipulation can occur. And if that's how you feel, it's okay to not have that. But I encourage you to seek out other communities like our community or other people in your area, like I was talking about earlier, like the YMCA or, um, you know, go to take a class or learn something new. I want you to feel like you have people around you and you have support and, you know, other friends and stuff like that. Um, But it's, it's completely okay to, to continue with church and maybe go to a new church or to not at all. That's completely up to you. Um, Yeah. I think it's part of the, the reading of the scripture and the taking your own time alone and as much as you can withholding that judgment because, you know, there's no place for that here. We have to, I think it's healing for all of us, not even just in a religious capacity. I think it's an incredibly healing and helpful tool to be able to consider and go inside of ourselves and consider our thoughts, our beliefs, what we like, what we don't like, and withhold judgment as long as possible. Being able to do that internal work without the 
I don't, the hindrance of judgment, I guess, is honestly just harmful. I feel like judgment is, is just, it kills that internal work. It makes us think it can only look and feel one way and we can judge our response and then feel bad about it or whatever. And so as much as you can do, and it might be in little bits, you can only do like five minutes at a time, but do some prayer, do some reading, do some journaling, consider your options. Do I want to stay in church? Do I not want to stay in church? Do I believe in this? Do I not? Do I think I need to, uh, I can't cuss or I can't drink or I can't have sex before marriage. Do I agree with all those things? Is it guilt ridden? What am I afraid is going to happen if I don't? Um, They said that I also needed to pray every day or tithe this. Do I agree with that? Is that something that I also think is good? Um, You know, like I always agreed with tithing because how else is your church supposed to support itself? You know, these are just things that I I personally had thought about um, when I was younger and part of church. Just give yourself the opportunity to think about it. And I might encourage you if, if you feel okay doing this, again, this is completely your choice, but it might be healing to not go to church while you do this work, you do all of your work at home on your own, because that prevents us from having other people's interpretations of, you know, religion or the word of God getting into our head and us having to just, you know, it it can make it more complicated. I think sometimes it's easier when we're doing it on our own. And it might be also helpful to find a therapist who works with religious trauma. I know that can be tricky. There's a ton of good blogs. I'm forgetting them, but If anybody knows of them, please leave them in the comments. I, when I was doing um, research for my religious trauma video, I I stumbled upon a whole bunch of blogs and Reddit threads and of support of people talking about uh, religious trauma informed therapists and their own process to getting, a lot of it was to getting out of, um, you know, the Mormon church or what was the other one was incredibly common. Oh, Jehovah's Witness. A lot of people are talking about like getting out of those churches and how traumatizing that was. And I'm not dogging on any religion. I'm just saying there was a lot of support for that. that. And there's a lot of support for others in the purity culture of the 90s. Anyway, there's a ton of help out there. Please just look into it. If anybody knows of blogs and resources and um, ways to find religious trauma-informed therapists, please share that in the comments. But I really think it's going to be helpful for you to do this on your own so that you can do it without judgment or without someone else's words getting into your head. Okay. Thank you so much for sending in your questions. Thank you for watching and listening. Thank you for all the five-star reviews and for sharing this with other friends and family members. It's incredibly helpful. It helps us grow as a community, um, helps allow me to continue creating these podcasts, which I love doing. Have a wonderful rest of your week. I hope you found this um, helpful and beneficial for you. I will see you soon. Bye. Thank you.